what I'm going to say to you, this is now we're getting on provocative territory, I'm going to say, think John Lewis. Uh, the staff in John Lewis, in my experience, are courteous. They're even helpful. And they're trained to be that. My son, uh, who was at university, had a, a, a vacation job working in John Lewis in the toy department, which he absolutely loved, and he was trained as to how you look after uh, customers. John Lewis, the goods are usually good. They're never knowingly undersold. Bit of value for money argument there. And the staff have a financial stake in the success of the enterprise, because it's a cooperative. So you've got a, you've got a model here. How can we get this type of approach into the surgery and the hospital? And I know immediately th the more intelligent of you and those of you who are awake will think of a thousand and one objections to this comparison. But stay with the principle. How do we get service, which is what patients are interested, back into the National Health Service? Well, I'll say the following. To answer the question about service. First, we need to be concerned not about structures, not about organizations, not about management. We must be concerned with culture. What I have called, when I gave evidence in mid-staffs, <coughs> the culture of care. I'm talking about how we get service back in, and the first thing I'm saying is, we have to address the issue of culture, the culture of care. Whether patients are properly looked after doesn't ultimately depend upon whether there's an SHA or an RHA or a DHA or a CQC or a monitor. It depends on the vocational commitment of those caring for them and the culture of caring for patients that professionals must have. Now, clearly the NHS has got to provide an environment in which professionals are unable to do what they're trained to do. But for too long, in my view, professionals have found it easy to blame, quote, the system, and not reflect it on their part in this cultural failure. The system. It wasn't the system which caused the nurse to tell a patient in Maidstone and Tunbridge Ho uh, Wells Hospital who needed a bedpan to go in the bed, dear, because she was busy. It was the nurse's complete abandonment of the notion of service and professional duty. So to me, there needs to be a rekindling of the culture of care. It's too often lacking in the offhand treatment of the person kept waiting, in the rudeness or the incivility of the receptionist, the failure to explain what's going to happen or what has happened, in the loss of notes, oh, they've gone, they've gone again, in the need of parents to make trip after trip to different places to tell the same story to different people. cultures, that's the culture. It's got nothing to do with structures and organizations. And cultures don't easily change. Change must come through NHS, the NHS and professional, to a, come to a realization. And this is so obvious, you have to say it every five minutes, that they're there for the patient. It's not the other way around. Many professionals realize this. Too many appear not to. So if you're talking about rekindling, reintegrating service, the first is you've got to deal with this culture, the culture of caring. Not say, I'm part of a system I can't control and therefore I don't have to do. The second is you've got to change, reintroduce notion of service through leadership. 
it's got to reinforce its commitment to service through the signals it sends to those who work for it and in it. Leadership, I know, is a word that you will then be wheeled out. And it's really, uh, as a concept, terribly interesting, but r rather empty. Because it depends on where the leader's leading. You can go forwards, backwards, or as usually happens, round and round. Leadership I have in mind is the unremitting concentration on service in all its aspects. Those, care for, those caring for patients should be properly trained, should be nurtured, should be supported, should be cared for and about, and rewarded for good work. There should be no tolerance of poor service. Think John Lewis. There must be a way of monitoring performance which collects the right information. Information about the service provided. And professionals need to do their part by putting s service, the centrality of service in their training system, in their revalidation, in everything they do. Equally, HR departments must ensure that the cleaner is as respected as the surgeon. They're all part of the service provided. You know the famous story of the two mops, do you? The two mops, there was the cleaner had one mop for doing the lavatories and one mop for doing the kitchen. And there was an outbreak of uh, uh, quite a virulent uh, bacterial out, uh, bacterium uh, outbreak in infection in, the, in a particular ward and no one could crack it, no matter what they did until suddenly Someone saw that the nurse was only using one mop, both for the lavatories and the kitchen. And the story was that she did have two mops, but someone took one of the mops. And she wasn't a particularly educated person who had been instructed in the nature of infection and so on, infection control. So she used the mop. And why didn't she report the loss of the mop? because she'd have had to pay for the mop that went. So she didn't. So what you've seen, what you see from that little tiny example, is if you don't think it through as m uh, administratively and managerially and look after your staff, you create the environment in which you can kill patients, putting it at its most dramatic. So it's professionals have this duty as leaders as well as the National Health Service General. And lastly, and I'm going to end on this, service, put service back in. We've said we have to do something about leadership and we have to do something about the culture. Now we have to do something about the private sector. Now, some of you will react with apoplexy, or perhaps worse, by reference to the private sector. <coughs> Think John Lewis. Unlike John Lewis, the National Health Service is a huge, monolithic, nationalized industry. Now, time and events have moved on, and we've come to accept that the operation of many services needn't and shouldn't be undertaken by the state, but not the NHS. Its iconic status has been equated with its being a nationalized industry. But its iconic status and its importance don't lie in its being a nationalized industry. Its importance its pricelessness lies in, you guessed it, three other things. Three things which are priceless, must never be bargained away. It's funded from general taxation, it's free at the point of need, and it's a comprehensive and integrated service. Now, the last two of those, uh, being free at the point of need, given prescription charges and all of that, 
last two of these, integrated as well, are struggling to maintain their purity. But by and large, that picture's valid. So that's what makes the NHS important, priceless. Free at the point of need, paid by general taxation, and a comprehensive service. Well, I think the challenge which faces us, and the challenge which some uh, reject outright for ill-considered reasons, in my view, is what contribution the private sector can make in the second decade of the 21st century when monolithic nationalised industries are largely the preserve of Cuba and North Korea. The private sector already plays a vast role in the NHS, and people don't get terribly fussed about it. The beds you lie on in hospital are not manufactured by the state. I just point that out in case anyone thought that the nationalisation meant that. Neither are the bandages, nor the drugs or medicines. And mechanisms exist to ensure that the taxpayer's financial interests are protected. Why don't we embrace the private sector, think John Lewis, into the provision of care in the National Health Service? The ground rules, you could make them clear. The key in all the rhetoric that you read, the key is the notion of profit, of course. Well, profit is what the private sector wants. As long as you have a system where the profit, profit is made from efficiencies in the system, rather than by taking a greater amount from the public purse, what's, what's the beef? The notion of service, the culture of care, can be made paramount in the deal. And the rewards and the disincentives organized accordingly. <coughs> the patient must be treated as the center of attention, the purpose of the enterprise. The patient is the person for whom the system exists. Think John Lewis. So, ladies and gentlemen, if patients are to be empowered in a more than trivial way, which is what Bob Sang believed in, you may have to go on a much more radical journey than you might have bargained for. I've offered some observations about the nature of that journey. Thank you. <laughs>